Hello, everyone, and welcome to our course on this beautiful, beautiful topic of compilers. Compilers, interpreters, formal languages, formal grammars, context-free grammars, intermediate representation, generation of code, all those things that are in the standard curriculum, right, in this undergraduate level class of compilers, we are going to cover. Right? So I'm putting everything under the umbrella of what I'm calling compilers here. I'm Gustavo Pazzi. I am a lecturer of computer science and mathematics here in London. And at the base of the pyramid of computer science, right, one of the, again, cliche to say, but one of the fundamental classes is compilers, right? It sits right there whenever we are talking about humans, right, these language-like things, and translating these high-level languages, these super modern fancy languages, to machine code, right? In my dinosaur brain, I still link the idea of compilers to my early years of using Pascal, and then Pascal basically generating machine code to run on those 386 computers that I used to study with. I still think of compilers as this kind of generating code to a machine, right? This high-level language generating code. I go and I compile, I check for errors, and then I generate, I spit out code for the machine, for the metal, for the CPU to run. Historically, compilers are known for being hard. I actually don't understand why it has to be that way, right? My goal is to have this kind of gentle introduction, right? It's almost like this first contact course on compilers and interpreters. We are going to implement from the ground up a programming language, a very, very simple programming language, procedural programming language called Pinky. It resembles a lot Lua, right? If you ever coded in Lua, that is what we're going to tackle. It's very dynamically typed programming language, very high-level programming language. This is our goal, right? We're going to create first an interpreter for this language, and after that we're going to have to talk about code generation. Uh, and by code generation, I mean creating these instructions, right? Spitting out instructions for if statements, while loops, for statements, assignments, all these different statements of a programming language. We're going to have to cover all of that. But besides being just this code generation type of thing, right? This kind of spitting out instructions for the machine, for the CPU, for the metal, I want to talk to you about modern compilers, right? What is really modern compilers are about? Because compilers nowadays, we have to talk about code optimization, we have to talk about type checking, we have to talk about this kind of differences between front end and back end, right? Before web dev uh, borrowed those terms, we used to talk about compilers as this kind of front end user syntax source code and then back end code generation. Uh, also, type checking, we have all this formal analysis of type checking, mathematical rigor in terms of type checking, Compilers, you will see a lot of people talk about also intermediate representation because we want to decouple these ideas of having one specific uh, target architecture, right? I don't want to have a compiler that only works for ARM or another compiler that only works for x86 or another compiler that only works for 68,000 Motorola CPUs. We decouple a lot of things and we have this difference between intermediate representation and target specific architectures based on their understanding of that machine, right? So you have these ideas of decoupling these things. Modern compilers, they are a beast. We have to talk about different ways of compiling stuff. You have ahead-of-time compilation, you have just-in-time compilation, you have single-pass compilers, multi-pass compilers. There's a lot, a lot of terms, a lot of jargon that we have to cover, but trust me, we're gonna try to approach this as gentle as possible, right? Again, this is a first encounter from first principles approach. Everything that we're going to create is going to be from first principles. We are going to sit down and have an honest conversation about compilers, interpreters, and how these things are implemented. Speaking of which, let me just quickly talk to you about the pipeline and the flow that we're going to cover, right? Because we're going to start with something called lexical analysis, right? We're going to have a source code written in this programming language called Pinky. Super simple, procedurally oriented, right? Procedurals, just functions, if statements, while statements, super simple. We're going to go for lexical analysis. 
Lexical analysis is basically just scanning and finding tokens in our source code, right? Identifying these atoms, these little meaningful tokens, and generating a list of tokens. After lexical analysis, we're going to go to syntax analysis, which people usually call parsing, right? At this stage right here, we have to talk about formal grammars, right? We're going to talk about these context-free grammars. We're going to talk about these different ways of representing these context-free grammars, these grammars that are represented using uh, something called DNF form, right? So we're going to have this uh, Becker's null form. We're going to also talk about PEG, right? So parsing expression grammars is also another approach that we can use. So every chapter that we encounter, there are a little bit of like uh, ramifications, right? And these nuggets of information that we have to talk about, different ways of parsing, different grammar syntax, right? Gr different ways of representing grammar. This is what we're going to cover here in syntax analysis. Syntax analysis is going to go and generate something for us, right? It's going to generate this kind of intermediate representation, which in our case is going to use a tree data structure. So our source code that started from lexical analysis, went to syntax analysis, went through all that parsing stage, it is going to generate this model in memory of our source code, which is usually called, in our case, we're going to use something called abstract syntax tree. So this AST is going to be this model in memory with all these trees and nodes that we're going to create for each one of these expressions and statements that we find in our source code, all right? And this is super important. This is at the center of the stage because based on this model in memory, this is where we're going to go and start running several things. We can, based on this AST, we can generate and run an interpreter, right? So you can actually go and start visiting the nodes and running an interpreter. This is the first thing that we're going to do. We're going to create an interpreter for our language just based on the AST. Uh, this is going to use uh, a host language, a super high level host language. We're going to use a language called Python, right? I know, very unorthodox for us here at the school, right? We usually use things like C, C++. I chose to use Python as the host language for this first part. I have lost several hours thinking about the best way of teaching this. We need to focus on compiler and interpret specific topics, right? I don't want to get our minds distracted too much with memory management. What is the size? How many bits I need for this specific code? We can talk about that later, right? The first thing that we're going to do is use Python, a super high level programming language, just to get something out of the door. I just want to look at the source code, understand, not get our brains distracted too much with extra noise around these data structures. I just want us to go and focus on how should a compiler work? What is the pipeline that we're going to use? How do we perform parsing? And Python was the best option, at least in my experience, because we can really think about the high level understanding of things. It is a very good language for parsing strings, characters. So we kind of help us in a way of achieving this kind of interpreter, right? Up and running. Very well. Besides an interpreter, we have then a different part of the course where we're going to talk about code generation. Like I said, in my mind, when I think about a compiler, I still link back to my early years of Pascal, where I basically have to go and generate spit out code to run on a CPU. This is what code generation is kind of all about. We are going to write manually a VM for us. So we're going to have this virtual machine that is going to emulate what a real machine is all about, right? We're going to talk about stack, we have to talk about registers, we have to talk about program counter, we have to talk about memory access, load and store. So there's a lot of things that we have to talk about in the code generation phase. But for the code generation phase, keep in mind that we're going to implement what we call a stack-based virtual machine, right? That is going to be our approach, if you want to already a spoiler of what we're going to implement, right? So do you see how everything is operating on top of this memory model, this abstract syntax tree. Interpreter is going to run on the syntax tree. Code generation, in our case, we are going to look at the abstract syntax tree to generate these byte codes for the VM. Also, things like type checking, if you have to check for types for the language that you have, right? Even though, like I'm saying here, the language that we're using doesn't really require us to go and tell the types ahead of time of the variables. 
We can perform type checking as well based on the AST. So type checking is one example of things that we're going to run on the AST. And of course, code optimization, right? You have things like uh, constant folding, you have things like code reuse, so uh, vectorization. So code optimization is something that we can perform on top of our uh, AST. Gustavo, was that the only option? Do you have to generate uh, an abstract syntax tree? No, there are several other techniques. In our case, we have the luxury of having enough memory, I would say, to basically represent, right, to have this abstract representation in memory of our source code. And in our case, it's going to be an AST. All right? So I just wanted to give you some spoilers of what we're going to cover. Like I said, we're going to start using Python. Yes, we are going to use Python as this main host language to run our interpreter and code generation, but I want to make a pact with you. I know my audience and I know that if you are taking a course with me, usually you would want to squeeze all the performance that you want and really push the boundaries of what a native interpreter will do, right? Things like using C or C++. I know that, so this is what I'm going to do. We're going to do everything in Python, but every once in a while I'm going to come and we're going to have a little lecture where we're going to put our C programmer's hat on and then we can discuss how would you implement this using C, right? Because you have to think about reducing memory footprint, you have to think about performance, right? Python is really not known for being a super, super fast language, right? The implementation of Python usually can be hundreds, even thousands or tens of thousands slower than native C optimized code, right? But we have to talk about that, right? If you want to really squeeze performance, think about memory management, right? Garbage collection. So optimizing all these things, we are going to stop every once in a while and talk about the kind of potential C implementation of what we're doing, right? This is something that I want to do, of course. I, like I said, I know my audience. I know that this is something that most people would like to know. But for us to have an understanding, to have this kind of gentle introduction to these topics of AST, syntax analysis, lexing, parsing, generating code, we need to think of them as this kind of high level. I don't want to add too much noise. For that, we're going to use Python. Does that sound like a plan? So look, I don't want to waste too much time. There's a lot of talk already. I think you got the gist of what our course is going to be. During this journey, we're going to look at some really interesting programming languages, right? This kind of historically significant programming languages Algo, we're going to look at Algo. Pascal, we're going to look at Pascal. Lua is a programming language that is super, super interesting. We might take a look at Lua source code and see how they approach things. Uh, we're going to talk about JavaScript, right? We have to talk about JavaScript. Maybe it's not the best language, but we can learn some lessons from JavaScript. So yeah, as we are going, we're going to talk a lot about different programming languages. We're going to kind of open these branches and learn a little bit of historical context, right? Putting things into perspective. Why did programming languages decide to do that? What is these different methods of managing memory? We're going to sit down and have a friendly conversation about these things, right? This is how we do things here at the school. Right, so hopefully you are on board with my plan for how we're going to tackle this content. Like I said, historically, this content is hard. I don't know why it has to be that way. The content is actually super, super beautiful, right? The output of what we're going to have, the journey of starting from basically nothing and starting to build and build and incrementally add stuff and while statements and adding if statements and adding expressions with true or false and adding parentheses and adding expressions greater than, less than and adding while statements and loops and functions and thinking about these different ways of managing memory. Incrementally building all those things is one of the most beautiful things that you can ever build in the computer science uh, realm, right? This topic, I'm telling you, compilers, interpreters, it is extremely eye-opening, right? The moment that you build a programming language and you start connecting the dots of how these things are implemented behind the scenes, even if you don't actually use this type of domain-specific languages that you create, understanding how these things are implemented behind the scenes definitely makes us better programmers. All right, so without further ado, let's get this going. Thanks for joining me, and I'll see you inside.